always good, always good to see you. Tell me how you got involved in this, in this life, man. In this life? Horse racing. Well, I grew up with horses around me. Yeah. Always grew up with horses around me. We had ponies at home and a bit of hunting, a bit of jumping, that kind of thing. I was never much of a rider, it's got to be said. Uh, so the rest of my family were good. My mum was very gifted, gifted horsewoman. And really, my interest came from her. Yeah. And uh, then my dad got into the racing side of it. And they'd have the odd horse now and again. But when I was 8, 9, 10, I was always just more interested in studying the form and, and just loved racing. It was always on, on the TV in my house, and I just was completely captivated by it. Jumping to start with, and then, and then on the flat as well. And then I came to Kentucky when I was 18, and I worked for Dr. Pagan at Kentucky Equine Research and had a good year there, learned a bit about the sport and more maybe about this side of it, yeah. how the breeding industry, went back to London, went and studied, nothing to do with racing and all I really wanted to do was write, be a journalist, work in the media and just as I was finishing my my masters I, I, I landed on this opportunity to, to work doing American horse racing on an English racing TV station. And obviously the, the field wasn't very big, it was a short field, uh, and, I, and for that reason I was a runner. So I, I, I made the most of the opportunity, I guess, and, um, and, and the rest is history. I remember saying to my, my now wife, then girlfriend, when we were in our early 20s, I said, this will this will work for me until I get a job. And 20 years later, I still haven't, still haven't managed to find the job, but um, a lot's happened in the in between times, and I I love being here. I've always had a a really deep love of the sport in this country, um, and I, I'm just so grateful that I've been able to be a part of some fantastic broadcast teams here. Get to meet you mainly, and and others who are so passionate about the sport. So who's the um the best jockey you ever seen ride a horse? Well, I just about saw Lester Pick. I just about saw Lester Pick, and he he's the most legendary figure in this sport in my lifetime. But I think in terms of a, a complete rider, a complete world-class rider, maybe the most complete world-class rider there's ever been, people underestimate the, the skill and longevity of Frankie Dettori. Yeah, he's he's been remarkable. He, his career has has gone right through, you know, almost from my childhood to now. So he started in '86. I was eight years old in '86, and he's he's been riding Group of Grade One winners around the globe uh, until now. And and they always say if something looks good, it probably is good. And there's no one who there's no one who looks as complete and polished. And you know, aesthetically pleasing on a horse as, as him, and that still persists to this day, even though he's well into his sixth decade. Right, the name of this program is the real players inside the backstretch, as you know, right? How important is the men and women that do this job? And it's a two part, right? So versus how they treat the help in the U.S. versus Europe, what's the what's the, what's the difference, or is there any difference? I, there may be a difference. In truth, do I know enough about? the backstretch work and employment law in the US to give a qualified opinion as to as to who treats their employees better, I don't. What I do know is that there has been significant progress made in the in the last decade, particularly in, in Europe. I'd like to think the same was true here, but clearly we were starting from a base where we needed to do more because we know how valuable all backstretch workers are and we have a, a duty as a sport when we see the amount of money that is circling around in an environment like this, a rarefied environment like this in upstate New York on a Monday evening. We need to understand that without the workforce, this wouldn't be possible. And as long as we are mindful of that, then we are in a position to be able to look after our workers. We all, always need to be mindful of that.
I'm very proud that one of my, my roles in the UK is chair of the judges of the Godolphin, what we still call just about the Stable Staff Awards here is the Thoroughbred Industry Employee Awards. It's been a tremendous initiative, well supported by one of the biggest, biggest operations in, in global bloodstock and has given financial and uh, considerable, you know, emotional investment to to what to what happens behind the scenes on a on a day to day basis. I was talking this morning to a very good friend of mine, Sean Quinn, whose father John trains Highfield Princess, who won the Group One in Deauville yesterday, and I was interviewing him for my podcast. And I've had a, a bit of a horse in his stable for maybe 15, 16 years. And there's a, a senior groom that works in the, in the stable who I've known since I, I started having horses there. And I, I was so thrilled to see him leading this group one winner in yesterday at Dover. And I was talking to Sean about it and he said this was supposed to be his weekend off. And he cancelled his weekend off just so he could go and travel with the horse. And it, it's that that makes you realise how much the horse has been to the people that look after it. And they, by very nature, have a much greater and stronger um, emotional and physical connection to these animals than we as analysts, hunters, owners, even breeders perhaps do. And so I think that's something we've always got to bear in mind. That that's a connection that's very special and very important to making these horses run to their full potential. And without that, some some greats of the game would have been lesser mortals. And what's at the root of that? The people who are brushing them, tending to them, picking their feet out, feeding them, loving them, caring for them. And it's on that axis that the sport essentially revolves. Best trainer in your lifetime for you? I think in my lifetime, I was ju I'm just just old enough to remember the uh, the glory days. Well, not not the glory days, but I'm just old enough to remember the the back end of uh, of Dr. Vincent O'Brien's training career. And when you read all the all the books. And you, you study what the, the the example that he set and what he put in place and the influence he had not just on the way that racehorses are trained, but also on making the world a smaller place, which is something that I'm very passionate about in horse racing. I would say that he's the he's the greatest trainer who ever lived. So I would say I would say Vincent O'Brien in terms of the the influence he exerted on the sport, racing and bloodstock and his skill and ability as a trainer of any horse, whether it be a five furlong sprinter to a three mile steeplechaser and everything in between and all the derby winners and the influence he had over Lester Bigot and the foundation of Cool Horse, very hard to say that he wasn't he wasn't the greatest. And you know, what advice would you give me as a young now journalist in the game that's created something that's very impactful? Now what advice would you, with a huge following, give me drawing a huge following to a brilliant podcast. You have the best podcast. You know, you just got to bet on yourself. I try to get people to help me film it, shoot it. Everybody wants to charge me so much money until I invested in this camera myself, taught myself how to film, how to edit, and I'm just following my passion.